Yo, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Our first conversation is about one of the biggest issues in Nigeria at the moment, and it's uh, about grazing roots. President Muhammadu Buhari, during an interview with a TV station a few days ago, had said that he gave an order to the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malimi, to basically revive grazing roots in the country based on the Gazette laws of the First Republic. But lots of stakeholders have been reacting negatively to this. States are against it, PANDEF, and many others. So we're discussing this grazing roots and the opposition to it this morning uh, with a journalist and author, Mr. Faye Faremi. Good morning. Thanks for joining us from the UK. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's first begin with some history. How did the grazing roots, you know, take place and begin? Okay. So <clears throat> um, this is an interesting point. I mean, when we talk about reviving, I think the first thing we probably need to disabuse our minds about is that um, the solution to whatever whatever the solution is to the heather crisis today is not in Nigeria's past. You know, it, whatever the solution will be is is going to be in the future. We have to design it. Um, the past was not glorious. It was not um, some kind of utopia where you know um, farmers and herders got along. That's not actually true. I mean, one of the things we, we we talk about in our book is that this is a problem that has been in Nigeria for at least two hundred years, pro mm. probably longer. You know, when we go back, just to give one example, you know, the, the jihad that kicked off in northern Nigeria in 1804, um, when it kicked off in Sokoto, there were other parts of the country where, you know, almost kind of like a quote unquote freelance jihad kicked up, where people had been having local issues. And then that flared up into a jihad, taking, a, taking you know, a, 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 um, advantage of the general insecurity that had blown up. So you had play, a place like in northern Kebi, where a guy called um, Abubakar, uh, Jay, he he started off a jihad there, and you know th th this fight was basically caused by uh, constant clashes between farmers and herders. You can see, you can go back to the early 1930s, where you know the French, who were in charge of Cameroon, for example, blocked Nigerian uh, Fulani herders from coming into um, Cameroon as, as part of their grazing routes because they wanted to avoid these clashes with farmers. So there is no time in our past where we can say, oh, because we had grazing roots, um, everything was fine and, and it was all um, it was all rosy and dandy. So I think that's one of the things that we should first disabuse our minds about because we have a tendency to form this uh, myths about how you know the past was so glorious. We do it with textile, for example, where we talk about, oh, we once had a glorious textile. It was, these things are not really true. You know, grazing roots are just, you know, I mean, it, 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 they're not magic. You know, cows are very, very, uh, you cannot just put a cow anywhere and then you just expect them to start feeding themselves and then eating just because there's grass there. For example, cows would not eat tall grass. They don't like tall grass. They prefer shorter grass, you know, and that shorter grass, the type of grass you will probably find on farms, you know, so which is where all these clashes come from. We need to be. We need to make a deliberate solution. Something we've never tried before, which is that you know, when you have grazing roots and grazing reserves, you actually have to plant and grow the, the type of food or the type of uh, uh, grass that the cows will that will attract the herders and allow them stay in those places. You know, not it, it, to stop them from leaving those places and then going into people's farms. So, so I think the first thing I will, I will, I will just want to say is that you know there is no solution to this problem in Nigeria's past. You know, we've had this problem for centuries, at least two centuries, probably longer. It has always been it. Now it is a lot more uh, pronounced because of population growth and climate change and uh, urbanization, which has actually reduce the amount of space. But, you know, if we want to solve this problem, we need to think about the future and what it will look like and then design uh -huh. solutions based on that. Safari, so you've mentioned 200 years um, uh, back. Um, what, why would you say in 200 years we have not been able to um, change, you know, our method of rearing cattle? Uh, we've not been able to, you know, move with the times as a country um, in 200 years. Like, well, that's the, 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 did it need to get to, you know, conversation about death and killings and, and clashes before we start to talk about these things? Definitely not. No, you know, I mean, this is Nigeria. You know, we have a lot of problems that we, we allow to fester, you know. And we have an elite who like to play the game of uh, brinkmanship. You know, our elite have come to believe that, oh, you know, the country can go to the edge and somehow it will pull back. Not, 
they're not doing anything to solve the problem, but you know, we play these games all the time. For example, now we're looking at a situation where the country is literally in, serial, in a serious crisis. And what are they really thinking about? They're probably thinking that let's just get to 2023, we'll have elections and then change government and then another set of people. You know, so this game of brinkmanship has been with us for a long time, whereby we don't solve problems, we paper over them for a while, and then they appear, and then we are surprised. You know when they appear uh, all over again. Th this problem, you know, and I, I tell people this all the time. The United States had this exact same problem of clashes between cattle herders and farmers, and it was actually more violent in America because obviously everyone had guns. But you know, a series of policy choices and changes solved this problem completely, where it, it no longer exists today. If we want to solve this problem, which is why I said if we want to solve this problem, it is in our future. We have not, it, it, it is mainly starting from an economic problem, whereby there is no way for a cattle um, uh, rarer to break even if he has to pay for his cow's food. That is the fundamental problem, uh, the, fundam the basic underlying problem. If a cattle herder has to pay for the food, his cow, his food and water, he, he, he cannot make uh, a profit. A friend of mine shared something recently where, you know, he said cost of feeding a cow in a day is about 1,500 naira. That cow, if you are lucky, will produce two liters of milk. A liter of milk is 250. So if you produce two liters of milk, you, you sell it for 500 naira, you are still in a deficit of 1,000 naira in a day. So this problem is quote unquote solved by going into farms and eating food for free. That is the way it was, you know. So that's one side of the problem. The other part of the problem that makes it difficult to solve is that culturally, the, the nomadic Fulani are very, very um, proud and stubborn people, you know. And, I, and I, I don't say this as a bad thing, you know. You know, they, they are, they are, this is just who they are, you know. Culturally, they, are, they, they don't, they, for example, they don't like farming, you know. So, they, 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 I mean, they consider things like farming beneath them. They don't like butchering, for example. Actually, butchering the cows or something they call, they consider that another person's work. So, if, you know, their dislike for farming, and this was something that uh, one of the president's special advisors recently said, that their dislike for farming means that they are not going to plant the grass for their cows to grow. And this gives us a problem, you know. If they are not going to plant the grass that they are, or, or the, the, the crop that they are, their cows will eat, then who is going to do that job? You know, so, so all of these problems, all of these challenges have, have, you know, have allowed us to, you know, and, and again, when you combine with the fact that the kind of elites we have, it just means that this problem just keeps kick, getting kicked down the road. Maybe we might have a period where things are quiet for five minutes, but then it flares up in a bigger way after all. So if we want to solve the problem, we need to grasp that nettle and design a solution for the future, whereby in, in the future whereby we know that, you know, we can eliminate these clashes once and for all. Again, I mentioned it's not impossible. The United okay. States faced a bigger, you know, a more dangerous version of this, and they solved it. So, yes, you, you've raised lots of points that would bring up much later in the conversation. Well, looking at the president's directive, you know, to revive grazing roots, do you see any rationale behind that? Well, the president is a very, very nostalgic person. He seems to think that, um, you know, things were always better in the past. And, well, I guess to, it's not something unique to him, you know. Generally, people always think that the past was better than the present. So he probably thinks that uh, grazing roots were uh, are the solution, where maybe when he was younger, maybe grazing roots were peaceful or people uh, went through them. But again, like I mentioned, you know, grazing roots is one thing. But the cows are not going to eat what is, they are not just going to go to any grass and eat it. You know, cows are picky. We, we need to understand that, you know, cows, I always make fun of cows that they have the best PR in the world. You know, they're very lazy. They eat all day, they sleep, and then after feeding a cow for one year, it will give you one cow, you know, just one, you know, compared to pigs, for example, where a pig, will, a pig can eat anything, and then it will give you, like, loads of piglets in a year. You know, but cows have, you know, like I said, they have very, very good PR and they've manipulated us human beings because of the beef we, we get from them. So you are not just going to put a cow on a grazing route and then the cow will just see any grass anywhere and eat it. No. You know, like I mentioned, the tall grass, they don't like tall grass. They prefer the short grass. It's sweeter to, to, to the cow. So even if you revive these grazing roots, you have to do that work of ensuring that the feed that they like you know, so, the, so who should do that work, work, Mr. Faramir? Should that be the job of the government? Or if we say that these, you know, herding is a private activity, should the, fa should the herders be doing that? Well, yeah, so, so that's a good question. I mean, who should do that job? Well, I think that 
at the start, you need heavy government involvement to subsidize a lot of these things to get it going. So it's like a seed, you know, it's like a seed um, investment by the government. Things like, for example, uh, you just to use a more recent example, vaccines, you know, when the world needed vaccines last year, if we had relied on just private capital to do it, it might have taken a bit of a bit longer. But, you know, governments, especially the United States government, United Kingdom government, they stepped in and sort of said, OK, you know what, whatever you produce, we'll buy it. You know, so that was government stepping in to take away the risk of somebody producing a vaccine and then nobody buying it. So a lot of people, for example, have produced vaccines that, are, that, you know, whatever happens, they will get their money back. So this is the kind of thing that we would need the government to do. The government to, even if you're going to get private capital to go in, at least at the start, the government has to enter and take away a number of the risk from it. You know, and that risk will include things like security and ensuring that people's investments uh, is, re is rewarded. So if people are investing in, in, so maybe government can step in and say, okay, whatever grass you produce, if you are able to produce us this specific type of grass, which is the grass that cows like, any amount you produce, we will buy it off you for, I don't know, three, four years. You know, and over time, then the government will reduce its involvement until it then becomes sustainable. Whereby maybe you can get the um, the if the if the grass is better maybe then the Fulani uh, cows can then start to produce more milk and again this is a factor if they start to produce more milk then that milk can generate income and then you get to the point maybe over five six seven ten years whereby a Fulani a Nigerian cow can then produce enough milk to be sustainable in a day whereby the sale of the milk can then pay for the food. That the um, that the cow eats. So, so this is kind of thing. That, this is kind of thing that um, the government should step in to do. Basically, entering at the beginning to take away a lot of the risk, guaranteeing investments, and then over time we will get there. We're wasting too much time. You know, if we start today, we have a shot at solving this problem over the next ten to twenty years. But every day we don't do it, we're wasting our time. So, a grazing route is is just one part of the solution. The actual investments needed to ensure that the cows that are passing these grazing routes actually have something to eat. Is another part of the conversation. All right, um, Mr. Faremi, uh, th th there's people who would argue that Nigeria is not top five largest, um, you know, cattle or beef or you know milk producers in the world. There are other countries that have way more cattle than we do, but they don't have this crisis. Um, and um, you know, there's also conversations about why in 2021 or in the last couple of years, five six years, one of the biggest conversations that the giant of Africa has had is on, you know, about cattle, um, even at, uh, you know, the expense of human lives in their hundreds and maybe even thousands. Um, so what, what are your thoughts concerning those statements and why we still are where we are today? And we're even considering government, um, you know, intervention with helping cattle rearers. Um, why, you know, why, why we still haven't been able to actually focus on prosecuting and ending the loss of human lives that this has caused. Yeah. I mean, I share that frustration. You know, it is, it is annoying. You know, it's, a, it's an annoying problem to be dealing with. I mean, here we are on a Tuesday morning in 2021, June. We are talking about cows. You know, if you pick up any Nigerian newspaper today, you are probably going to see stories about cows on the front page. You know, but this means, this tells us that this is a problem that we should solve and move on to other things. This is like a gear one problem, you know. There are other problems about cattle that we have not even got into at all. There are other things about the beef industry, building a proper beef industry. There are other problems around storage of beef, you know, a cold chain, a value chain whereby, you know, you can, you don't have to carry a cow from Kanu to Lagos because you don't have a cold chain, whereby you now have to carry a cow from the north to the south and kill it in the south so that people can then buy up all, all of that, you know. We should be able to have a, an industry whereby you can kill a cow in the north and then transport it, you know, securely in a cold chain down to the south to anybody who wants it. You know, so these are all the problems that are gear four, gear five, you know, when we get there. But we are stuck in gear one. But unfortunately, there's no shortcut around it. We need to first solve this very basic problem that we've neglected for so long. The basic problem of how do we get cattle herders and farmers to live side by side in peace without one person encroaching on the other person's uh, uh, territory. And for each, in mutual respect, let everybody respect each other's territory, that sort of thing. So this is the problem that is detaining us and we are, and we are stuck on it. Unfortunately, if we don't solve this very basic part, we can't move on to the other um, interesting But we, we can build a multi-billion dollar 
uh, uh, cattle industry in Nigeria, with, with all the various deriv derivatives of it, you know, milk, beef, we, we haven't even touched all of that at all, you know, because we are stuck in this gear one problem. So, you know, I mean, like I said, if we want to move on to other things, we should, we should be channeling our energy to this particular problem so we can get rid of it quickly. Again, this is not the hardest part to solve. But we, you know, if we pour resources and pour our direct thinking at it, we can, like, we have the shot, like I said, in the next 10 to 20 years to eliminate this problem once and for all and then move on to higher quality problems. Okay, so we're still in the, in the gear one, like you mentioned, and it's still about grades and roots. So we know that uh, Senate spokesman Adibola Bashiru uh, mentioned that the uh, Gazette of the First Republic is not a federal law and that there is really no backing and no legal basis for what the president has said. But in a situation like we've seen where, you know, presidential directives are given without any law that supports it. So what's the likelihood that these grazing reserves or great grazing routes, I beg your pardon, would actually be enforced on state governors? And how do you think they might take it, seeing that about 17 of them in the South, you know, openly, you know, banned open grazing? Well, you know, this brings us back to the problem we talked about earlier. You know, like I've mentioned, uh, uh, like I said earlier, there is no solution to this problem in Nigeria's past. We are deceiving ourselves. If you think that you can go and pick up a document from the uh, from the First Republic or a design from the First Republic and then impose it now and then everything will be fine, you're wasting your time. You know, there have been clashes between herders and farmers. We need to understand this. There have been clashes between herders and farmers for centuries in Nigeria. You know, because it is pronounced now due to climate change, uh, greater cow population, greater human population, more urban density does not mean that in the past this problem was not there. It was there, you know. We had this clash. So debating over a 1960 something gazette or whatever, it's just a waste of time. We're wasting each other's time. What we need, the solution is in the future. In Nigeria of today, what are the challenges? How can we design a solution that takes us to a, a future in 20, 10, 20 years time where we have eliminated this problem? If we're arguing over the Gazette, you know, it's just another way for our elite to posture and kick the problem away and not do anything about it. The Southern governors are not going to agree because now they've been able to unite and they have all come out and said, oh, no open grazing. So we can actually be fighting this nonsensical issue for five years, another five years, you know, and nothing will, nothing will happen. You know, when maybe when uh, President Buhari leaves, the, um, the, the presidency comes to the South and then the North then takes up the um the the argument that it it's reversed whereby right now is the south that has been intransigent and then maybe by then once the north is out of power then you know we can be kicking this can back and forth for this for, for another five ten years and you can see how problems get unresolved in nigeria for so long you know again let us forget about what was in some gazette or whatever we can borrow ideas from it but the idea that grazing roots or something because it was written in some first republic law is the reason why we're having problems today because we did not implement those. it's complete nonsense you know we should be honest with ourselves how do we get herders to feed their cows in a sustainable way without encroaching on farmers how do we get how do we make this thing a sustainable business whereby a herder can feed his cows and generate income from milk or, or anything else that pays for the feeding of his cow. How do we put this thing on a sustainable basis? Uh, this business on a sustainable whereby headers will then be encouraged to sit in a grazing reserve because there is food there and they don't need to go around trampling on people's farms or looking for food all over the place. And with climate change, this means that they now have to go further and further and further to look for food because a lot of the old grazing routes are, you know, they, I mean, they, they, things don't grow there anymore as they used to. So we now have we now have this challenge whereby the clashes between herders and farmers are becoming a lot more pronounced. So please, you know, our elite are just posturing. They are not, this is not a serious debate. You know, IQ never was in some First Republic law or something. The solution, as I said again, is in the future. It's not in the past. All right. Um, let's also talk about the angle on uh, law enforcement, uh, justice for, you know, lives that have been lost, you know, and the possibilities of uh, being able to change the stereotype nomadic Fulani from a you know, person who likes to move around with his cattle to a person who understands that you, know, there's, you, know, you can actually put your cattle in one place and feed them and um, um, you know, milk them. 
Um, so if a government, like you've suggested, decides to step in, you know, with its own levels of support, and they're able to afford feeding for their cows and all of that, how do you change uh, that culture of being a nomad in these people? And then also talk about the law enforcement, you know, um, aspect uh, of, of this to save lives. Yeah. Right, that's, so that, that's another very good question. Um, I always tell people that, you know, one of the things that many people, we don't probably realize is that they are, very, very broadly, there are two types of Fulani, you know, and this has been going on for centuries, you know, in, in, there's the settled Fulani, and these are the scholars, the people who, you know, they come to a town, they settle in one location, they become teachers, they they, they, they read very, very much, they are, they've embraced literacy for a very, very, very long time. They intermarry with the local people, they they adopt the languages of where they are, you know, so this is the, um, th these are the, uh, the settled Fulani who are or some people call them the house Fulani, who are, you know, they're, they're, they embrace education very, very much. Now there's the nomadic Fulani, uh, you know, who are, are very, very different. Now these two groups, they actually have not really liked each other. You know, so, I mean, you might think that, oh, you're just looking at two uh, Fulani, but they, they've had challenges between themselves for a very, very long time. Now the, the nomadic Fulani, they don't settle in one place. They move around. They don't like education at all. They still speak the full full day language. They don't they don't embrace literacy. They don't intermarry, you know, and they have so many, you know, different cultural aspects. They they look at the settled Fulani as traitors or, or that sort of thing. So so these two groups are, are very, very different. And, you know, we've tried uh, many solutions in the past that haven't worked. I mean, if you are of a certain age in Nigeria, you probably remember uh, nomadic education from the former education minister, uh, Professor Babs Fafunwa, where he tried to send people to to look for the elders and educate them where they were. It didn't really work work out properly, but but that just means that we should we we need to try um, others now. Uh, from the point of view of culture, well. It's a very, very challenging problem. There are no easy solutions to that culture, but, but culture is malleable. You know, culture can be changed. You know, there are people who have been nomadic people in the past and today they are settled people, you know. So again, I feel like, you know, because a lot of their uh, uh, roving about is driven by looking for food for their cattle. If we are able to solve this food problem in a certain location, in grazing results for them, then I, I think over time, I think that problem will go away. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced that the Fulanis enjoy walking all over the place in the hot sun looking for uh, for food for their cows themselves. If there is a solution that allows them to stay in one place and, you know, have water, have uh, grass for their cows, you know, I, I, I suspect that, they, you know, that over time, it might not, it will not happen overnight, but over time, maybe in a generation, you you, you might find that um, your, your pastoral Fulani no longer roam about because they are able to access their, their, their needs in one location. So again, you know, like I mentioned, all of this is driven by climate change, so we need serious uh, solutions. In terms of insecurity, well, you know, this is another problem that has plagued Nigeria for a, long, for a long time. The question of unresolved injustice. You know, so now, because we've allowed this problem to fester, a lot of injustice has built up. We will have to resolve that. You know, and, and this is not just, a, you know, a lip service. You have to be able to say, this person, right, somebody has a wrong has been done to somebody. You have to have a mechanism to resolve that, whereby somebody says, oh, somebody killed my family, killed my wife, killed my child, you know, and you can actually, on behalf of the state, recompense that person. You know, you cannot bring the child back, but you can punish the person who did that thing. You know, justice has to be done visibly so that people can see it. And, and this, this, will, this is, we, we cannot escape this. We have to figure out a way we have to have a system whereby people who have been wrong, somebody took your land, you know, we should be able to give that person back the land and punish the person who took the land. You know, no matter how highly placed that person is, somebody killed, somebody committed murder, we need to be able to find that person, you know, try them and then punish them for the crime that they have committed, you know, and then maybe compensate the person who has suffered a loss. So, you know, we have that challenge whereby even as much as, even if we fail, even if we, we resolve the injustice problem now by, I don't know, maybe sending soldiers to go and uh, shoot people. And again, the state also plays a part in, in fueling this injustice where, you know, the state in the, in the process of trying to solve problems, they go and create even more problems. But, you know, the, this, um, you, you cannot, I think what I'm trying to say is that, you know, insecurity is only as good as how much you resolve the underlying injustice. Because if you don't, then people will take laws into their own hands. So, and then you have this spiral that we have where the Fulani, somebody told me a story some years ago where 
Um, there were some farmers who were uh, somewhere in, in, the, in the middle belt. They planted a farm, uh, and then some Flanic uh, herders brought their cows, and they asked if they could eat uh, from the farm. And the people said no. The arguments broke out. In the end, the, Fulani, the, the cows went ahead anyway and ate from the farm. The, the, the farmers then poisoned their, they, they, they then put some poison on their on their land, you know, and then the cows came back again and ate that. Then the cows died, and then the Fulanis were so upset, they, you know, and then you have this whole orgy of killing whereby the Fulanis then went and, you know, uh, they, they, they attacked the farmers. And then, but, but you see, this is the cycle of, you know, revenge and injustice because there's no state in there to mediate problems like this. Even people who poison their land, you know, they're poisoning not just for the cows, but for themselves because they can no longer plant on that farm. And then you have this whole spiral keeps going on and on when the full and kill the, uh, the people as revenge. The people also, you know, they, they regroup and then attack the full and as well. And it goes on and on and on. So we have to have a mechanism for resolving injustice. You know, for somebody who has been wronged, we need to be able to uh, I, I say, look, this is the person who wronged you. We will give you justice, we will give you compensation, and we will punish the person who did that for you. Okay, so if we've been able to establish from our conversation that one of the challenges here with this farmer's head issue is food. You know, these people are pastoralists and they have to move around for their herd to eat, right? And one of the solutions is for them to be able to settle in a place such as a grazing reserves where their cattle have all they need to thrive. So how then do we convince states otherwise? Because right now they've banned open grazing and they're saying, especially states like Benue, the Benue state governor is very very vocal about this, saying there is no land for grazing reserves in their states. So how then can we begin to, you know, convince states to, you know, work together with the federal government to establish these grazing reserves so these herders can ha site their herds in one place and they don't have to move around? Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you, uh, if, you, if you want to put, if you want to establish a grazing reserve in Benue, you are only playing to the hands of opportunistic politicians. In there, because I mean, the Benue people are not cattle headers, you know. Culturally, they're, they're, you know, so anything if you bring in a, a grazing reserve there, you it almost feels like an imposition on them, and they will, they, you know, and the position will always use that to rally people and say, look, we don't want this thing, you know. So the the obvious solution is that the grazing reserve should be mostly in the north, you know, at least the bulk of it. you. If you try and put the grazing reserve down south. You know, maybe in or your state or something, you're going to run into serious challenges. So, this grazing reserve, I think that the solution should be that it should be in the north where people are, where where the, the bulk of the cows are, and where a lot of the headers come from. I think that's just a simple solution. You know, may, you might have one or two, but then it has to be a voluntary acceptance if you're going to put it anywhere, anywhere else. And I think that the plans that the government currently has actually has the vast majority of those grazing reserves are to be in the north. So, so I think that would be a solution. Don't 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 put a grazing reserve in Benue State. You know, I mean, you're just you're just going to create another political problem for yourself, and then politicians will just take it as another football to be kicking about between themselves for another five years or something. You know, put the grazing reserves in the northern part of the country where most of the cows are and where uh, a lot of the headers come from. And I think you will solve that uh, problem. I mean, I don't I, I don't think. Uh, people of Sokoto are going to complain that they don't want a grazing reserve or, or, or in Zamfara or, that, or Kebi or other places like that. Okay, so now, despite you know these conversations, the Robin minds of all the possible solutions beyond grazing routes, the president here said this is something they're, they're moving forward with. You know, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, the Senate is saying this is not a federal law. So if the government starts the process of making these grazing routes, reviving them and making them law, how do you think you know this will work out long term for the country? Well, then we have a political problem in that sense because, you know, there's only so much that the government can impose, the federal government can impose on states. Our constitution protects states. Uh, states have rights. Uh, federal government has rights. States have their own rights as well. So, you know, we have to negotiate it. I mean, it, it just means that we're going to waste a lot of time, you know, back and forth trying to do that, whereby the, the, the states will, uh, uh, some states will reject it, some states will accept it. It's up to the government, however quickly they want to move, maybe create incentives and say, okay, you know what, if you give land, then we'll, we'll put a certain amount of funding and then we'll provide security and then we can guarantee that some jobs will be created in that sense. So that, that probably is uh, it, it's going to take a longer process, but 
you know, it's a, like I said, it's a political process. It will come with negotiation. Again, going back to the question of the United States, this is how it was done, whereby, you know, the federal government and the states came to an arrangement where they, they eventually established uh, ranching and grazing reserves in, in different states. So, you know, it, we, I guess, you know, it's a political pro problem. If the government is interested in solving it, they can start, even if you only have one or two states to start off with, start it. You know, and let that be an example. Again, you know, one of my favorite quotes about the federal system was uh, from an American Supreme, Justice, um, Supreme Court justice who said that the beauty of the federal system is that it allows the states to be laboratories whereby one state can carry out an experiment without risking the rest of the country. So a, a state can carry out an experiment. If it goes wrong, that failure is isolated in that one state. But if it goes right, other parts of the country can then copy it and then the idea a good idea can spread across the country so you know if we can start off with just one state or two states you know start it off there if the idea is good if it works you know if, if it's a proper solution then you can spread it out across to the rest of the country thank you very much uh for your thank time you for this morning me. thanks thank for you. speaking with us uh, we wish you a beautiful day ahead thank you and you too all right uh, stay with us, of course, moving away from grazing routes and cattle. Now we're going to be talking telecommunication workers who uh, seem to be upset with their working conditions and are threatening a three-day warning strike. Uh, we're going to be getting into that right after the short break here on The Breakfast. <laughs>